Welcome to topic three, where we'll look at domain bacteria and very briefly, because I simply can't help myself, domain archaea. What you're seeing here are bacteria. These are E. coli. We can see that they have little extensions, little hair-like structures known as fimbriae, and then out the back we can see flagella that they use to move around. As you no doubt recall, we have three domains of living things. We have the eukarya, which consists of the plantae, the fungi, the animalia, and the protista. Then we have domain bacteria and domain archaea. These are grouped together into the prokaryotes based entirely on their structure and not on their biochemistry. We also, of course, have non-living entities that can be pathogenic, and that's the viruses and the prions. Hopefully, you also recall that all living things can be traced back to a common universal ancestor. The bacteria and archaea appeared first about 3.8 billion years ago, and the eukarya appeared a little bit later. The eukarya are an offshoot of the archaea. The eukarya also contain contributions from bacteria though. So almost all eukarya, with a few exceptions that we'll talk about later, contain mitochondria. The mitochondria were derived from bacteria that are quite similar to current day E. coli. Some of the eukarya are photosynthetic and they contain chloroplasts that were derived from bacteria as well, bacteria that were quite similar to current day cyanobacteria. I think, I hope, I did a good job of stressing how important microbes are, how the vast majority are beneficial. Prokaryotes in particular are everywhere. They make up more than half of the biomass the living material on the Earth's surface. They're in the water, they're in the air, they're in the soil, they're everywhere. Typically they're quite small, about one to two micrometers in diameter, although there are some exceptions, there are some rather large prokaryotes. And in terms of numbers of species, we really don't know how many species there are. We have 4,000 known species, species that have been characterized and described, but there may be as many as 4 million. Regardless of who you talk to, everyone agrees there's a lot more than 4,000. The problem with identifying prokaryotic species is that we're dealing with tiny little cells that in many cases look identical. So we have to look at DNA sequences, and that's something that's still really in its infancy. And even then, it's difficult to work out species relationships because bacteria have this interesting habit of exchanging bits and pieces of DNA. Distantly related bacteria will actually swap bits of information. What you're seeing in the photograph here is Staphylococcus epidermis. Pay attention to the names. They will quite often tell you a lot about the species. You've probably already figured out where this thing lives. It lives on the epidermis. This is a very common bacteria that most of you will have living on your skin. Staphylo and Coccus, as we'll see, tell us about the shape and the growth form of the bacteria. As I also mentioned, bacteria are essential when it comes to recycling materials within the biosphere, the part of the earth that can support life. So if we didn't have bacteria, plants would run out of nitrogen, and then everything that ate those plants would also run out of nitrogen. We would run out of sulfur and carbon and all the different elements that are essential to life. They would become unavailable to us. But of course, there are bacteria that cause us harm. They act as pathogens, and that will be the focus of the course. So as you're seeing here, anthrax. Anthrax can kill. It can cause respiratory infections. It can cause skin infections. And this is one of the many pathogens that we will come back to. Here are several other bacteria pathogens and also disorders that we will come back to and talk about in more detail. As I mentioned before, I will keep coming back 
to the same examples and we'll look at them in different lights. We'll look at them in terms of the species that's causing the problem. We'll look at how this particular disease spreads. So we'll look at the epidemiology and then we'll look later at the effects that it has on the different tissues and organs of our body systems. Last little bit of review before we dive into bacteria. Remember how bacteria differ from eukaryotes. And of course, recall that we are eukaryotes. So bacteria have circular DNA. They have one big massive chromosome. It's a big twisted circle of DNA. And then they may have plasmids. And the plasmids are much smaller circles of DNA that carry only a few genes. They don't have histones, which are balls of proteins that DNA is wrapped around in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes instead have their DNA packaged into a nucleus. And the DNA is found within straight or linear pieces known as chromosomes, but the chromosomes are not circular, they're linear, that's the big difference here. In bacteria, we don't have organelles, we do in eukaryotes, so we have the Golgi, we have the rough and smooth ER, etc. In bacteria, if we do have a cell wall, it's made out of something called peptidoglycan, which we'll talk about in more detail. In eukaryotes, if there is a cell wall, there isn't in us, of course, it's going to be made out of polysaccharide. Animals, which are eukaryotes, don't have a cell wall. Instead, they have an extracellular matrix that's made out of protein. In terms of cell division, cell division in bacteria can be very, very quick. In some cases, it takes less than 20 minutes, and it's performed by a process known as binary fission. In eukaryotes, asexual reproduction occurs through a cell division known as mitosis. And then, of course, we have meiosis that can produce gametes in some eukaryotes. In a typical bacterial cell, we have, of course, a big circular chromosome in the middle of the cell. It's all tangled up. And then outside of that, we don't have any organelles, we don't have Golgi, we don't have an ER, we don't have mitochondria, of course, but we do have ribosomes. There's other small circles of DNA known as plasmids, much, much smaller than shown in the diagram, but they can contain some rather important genes. Outside of that, we have a cell wall, which, as we'll see, may be quite complex, and then outside of that, we may or may not have a capsule or slime layer, which is made up of polysaccharides. We have a flagellum, and the flagellum is anchored within the cell wall and the plasma membrane. And unlike the flagella in eukaryotes, it spins. If you take a bacterium and you squash it, and you look at it under the electron microscope, you might see something like this. Imagine just taking one of these little cells and smashing it under your heel. So in this false color micrograph taken by an electron microscope, you can see the DNA that spilled out from this squished cell. And if you follow it, it's actually all one piece. So this is one massive loop of DNA. Although bacteria do lack a nucleus, that chromosome does tend to be centered within the middle of the cell, and we refer to that area as the nucleoid region. Prokaryotes have small genomes. A genome is the entire set of information, the entire set of DNA within a cell. The reason that they have small genomes is in part because they're simpler than eukaryotic cells, for instance. They don't need as much information, but also they're incredibly efficient. In prokaryotes, typically all of the DNA codes for something. It all has a role. Whereas in eukaryotes, there's quite often a lot of junk DNA. There's bits and pieces of leftover genes that used to do something in our evolutionary past, but they don't anymore. There's bits and pieces of viruses that have become incorporated into our genomes. And there's a whole lot of DNA that we have no idea what it does or where it comes from. So in humans, for instance, about 90% of our DNA has no recognizable role. Prokaryotes, again, they're very efficient though. They don't have all that quote unquote junk. 
We do have these much smaller circles, as mentioned, plasmids. They can be really important because they can contain genes that might, for instance, convey resistance to an antibiotic, and plasmids are quite easily exchanged between bacterial cells, as we'll see. Bacteria have ribosomes, of course, but the ribosomes are a bit different than the ribosomes in eukaryotes. They're smaller, and also they have a different composition. We can recognize the ribosomes as being different. They're made up of different proteins. They're made up of different sized pieces of RNA, etc. We quite often use the genes that code for the ribosomal RNA in classifying species. The photograph at the top taken with a transmission electron microscope and what you're seeing is a bacterium an E. coli that is dividing. It's undergoing binary fission. What happens is the cell elongates. Now prior to this that big circle of DNA was replicated so we had two circles of DNA. The circles of DNA will attach to the inside of the plasma membrane. Can't really see that here but they are attached and what's happening now is as the cell elongates those loops of DNA contained within the nucleoid region are being pulled to opposite ends of the cell. Down the bottom, you're seeing another image taken with a scanning electron microscope this time that shows circles of DNA known as plasmids. Usually the plasmids aren't completely open like that. They're usually kind of tangled up and twisted. Again, it's kind of like taking an elastic band and twisting it. We say that they're super coiled when they're all tangled up. Having the DNA tangled up like that, if it's not being used, means that it can be protected a little better. It's less likely to become broken. I should point out when you're seeing these photographs that when you take a photograph with an electron microscope, we generally call that photograph an electron micrograph. It's not technically a photograph. And those images are always black and white, but they quite often add a splash of color just to make them a little more exciting. So you're not seeing natural colors here. Despite the fact that plasmids are quite small, they're much, much smaller than the chromosome. And despite the fact that they don't contain very many genes, they can be very important. So as I mentioned, sometimes on plasmids, we'll find genes that convey antibiotic resistance. But we might also find plasmids that contain genes that allow for the synthesis or construction of a pillus. A pillus is a hollow tube that can be used to transfer DNA from one cell to another. So let's imagine that we have a cell that has a plasmid that contains genes required for antibiotic resistance, and it also has a plasmid that contains genes that allow for the construction of a pillus. Well, now this bacterium can form a pillus and it can transfer the plasmid that conveys antibiotic resistance to another cell, sometimes even a cell of a totally different species. And you can imagine how that might be important and how we might want to know that this is going on. In some cases, plasmids will contain genes that increase the virulence of a bacteria. They help the bacteria enter into other cells and cause damage, or they might contain genes that allow the bacterium to produce toxins or to produce their own antibiotics that they can use to fight off fungal cells, for instance. Or in some cases, there might be genes that will allow the bacterium to break down nutrients that it wouldn't normally be able to do. And again, the big deal here is that these genes that are found on plasmids can be transferred fairly easily to other cells and then those other cells are going to derive these new characteristics. Now I did say that bacteria don't have organelles but they may have internal membranes. What you're seeing here on the left is an aerobic prokaryote. Aerobic means that it likes oxygen, it uses oxygen to liberate energy from its food, the same way that our mitochondria do. They have membranes that contain a lot of proteins and protein channels and ATP synthase, much in the same way that mitochondria do. So sometimes we have internal membranes that just serve to house a lot of proteins that can be used in complex metabolic pathways.
in photosynthetic prokaryotes, we can have these membranes that again contain protein channels and enzymes and so on that are needed for photosynthesis. So these internal membranes might be present. They're not technically organelles, but they increase the area to which important proteins and enzymes can be attached. Now let's compare reproduction in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Remember that in eukaryotes, we have mitosis, which is asexual cellular division. And then we have meiosis, which produces gametes directly in animals. It's a bit more complicated in plants and fungi, as we discussed. But in eukaryotes, we have, of course, straight or linear chromosomes. We have several chromosomes. So in humans, we have two pairs of 23 chromosomes. The chromosomes have to be lined up in the middle of the cell along the metaphase plate after the nucleus breaks down. They have to be segregated. The nucleus has to reform, etc. So this is a complex process which tends to take a bit of time. In prokaryotes, we don't have sexual reproduction. We have an asexual form of reproduction known as binary fission. Fission just means splitting. Think of atomic fission, you're splitting an atom. And what happens here is that we have our great big circular chromosome in the middle of the cell. It's going to divide during the DNA synthesis phase, and we're going to get two circles of DNA. Each of those circles will attach to the inside of the plasma membrane, and that's what you're seeing, that little loop that's sticking out the top. Now the cell will simply elongate, and that's going to pull those two loops of DNA apart. Incidentally, the plasmids will segregate separately. They'll divide, and then they will also move to opposite ends of the cell. Classifying prokaryotes, as we've discussed, is rather difficult to do, but let's talk about a few ways we might go about this. Historically, we could do this by looking at them under the microscope, taking note of their shape, and then also exposing them to different stains and seeing whether or not certain stains stick. And we'll talk about these techniques and we'll have a chance to do these things in the lab. Now we could also look at biochemical characteristics. We could test to see if bacteria are able to break down certain nutrients, for instance, if they're able to live in anaerobic environments, etc. And more recently, we can look at DNA sequences. And this is typically the most promising if we're looking at bacteria that share similar biochemical characteristics and they look similar, then this is really all we have left. But it can be very, very helpful in figuring out relationships between organisms. One technique that we might use to amplify DNA and make copies of DNA so that we have lots of material to compare is PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. And we do have a PCR machine or thermocycler in the lab that you'll have a chance to see. One of the classic ways to identify different bacteria, at least it's a good starting point, is to look at the shape of the cells. Remember, the cells are very, very small, so they're 0.2 to 1 micrometers in width. And if we're dealing with rod-shaped bacteria, they might be 2 to 8 micrometers in length. We have four basic shapes. We have a caucus. That would be the singular, cocci, if we're talking about several of these. But caucus means berry. We're looking at bacteria that have a spherical shape. So these are cocci bacteria here. We could talk about a bacterium being a bacillus. This is a rod shape. So it has one dimension, of course, that's longer than the others. It's kind of shaped like a hot dog. We could have vibrio cells. These are shaped like a bent hot dog, like a banana, I suppose. And then we could have spirillum bacteria, where the bacteria have a corkscrew shape. We can also identify bacteria based on the arrangements that they form. We can have diplococci bacteria. So again, cocci refers to the fact that they are spherical. Diplo means two, so they tend to stick together in pairs. 
what happens is a cell will divide and it won't completely separate from the daughter cell. So we'll get two cells that are stuck together. If those cells divide again, then those cells will separate. We could have bacteria that grow in a chain and that's referred to as the strepto condition. So a streptococcus bacteria consists of a chain of spherical cells. We can also have a staphylo arrangement. This is where we have a cluster of cells. So they're not attached end to end in a chain, they're in a big mass. So in the top example there, we have staphylococci. Here we're dealing with cells that are spherical and they're stuck together in a mass. I should mention that we can have these arrangements with bacilli bacteria as well. So you can see in the bottom right, we've got a chain of bacilli. So that would be a streptobacillus growth form. So to summarize, we have coccus, which is a spherical shaped cell. We have a bacillus, which is a rod shaped cell. We have a vibrio, which is a bent rod. And we have a spirillum, which is a wiggly corkscrew shaped bacteria. We can have growth arrangements that are named diplo, where we have two cells stuck together, staphylo, where we have a mass of cells, and then strepto, where we have a chain of cells. If we were to continue trying to identify a species using classical means, after we had looked at the colony growth and identified the shape of the cells under the microscope and identified the growth formation or arrangement of the cells under the microscope, we might next look at the structure of the cell wall. So let's spend a bit of time talking about the basic structure of bacterial cell walls. They're made out of something called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is a mixture of protein, that's the peptid part, and also sugar, that's the glycan part. You can see in the diagram on the left that we have two types of sugar, NAM and NAG. And I'm not going to have you worry about those names or the structure of these sugars. Realize they're somewhat similar to glucose. You can see on the right that we have chains of sugar. We have an alternation between these NAM and NAG sugars. Adjacent chains of sugar are held together by peptides. Peptides are short chains of amino acids. So I'll circle one. Here we have a peptide. You can see that it consists of five amino acids. Here you're seeing two of these peptides. These ones are a little bit shorter, but we've got these two peptides that are being held together by a bond. We've got a covalent bond shown in red that's holding these peptides together. And because the peptides are attached to these chains of NAM and NAG, those chains of sugars are also being held together. So we have these adjacent chains of sugar that are being cross-linked, held together by these short little proteins, these peptides. Here's another representation of the same thing. So we have cylinders that represent the chains of sugars and then running at right angles to that, we have chains of amino acids that are holding those chains of sugars together. So it's kind of like a, a, a web of material. The cell wall of a bacterial cell is quite important to its structure. Typically water rushes into a bacterial cell we have pressure that builds up within the cell that's pushing out against the cell wall and the cell wall is pushing back. We say that the cell is turgid, which means it's under pressure. And that's the normal happy situation for a bacterial cell. You can imagine that if you weaken the cell wall, then there's a decent chance that the cell is going to rupture. There are quite a few antibiotics and other antimicrobial compounds that attack the cell wall for that very reason. If we can damage the cell wall of a bacterial cell, there's a pretty good chance it's not going to survive that. Two important categories of bacteria can be identified based solely on the structure of their cell wall. 
we can identify these different bacteria using a simple laboratory technique known as gram staining. Gram positive bacteria have a cell wall that contains a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. That's shown on the left. You can see the peptidoglycan in purple and notice that we have many, many layers of NAM and NAG sugars held together, of course, by peptides. Underneath that, we have the plasma membrane. Remember, plasma membranes are made up of a lipid bilayer. So we have two layers of phospholipids and then we have proteins embedded within that. There are other specialized proteins and also lipids and other compounds that are embedded within the peptidoglycan and also hold the peptidoglycan to the plasma membrane. Now let's compare this to a gram-negative cell. In a gram-negative cell, we have our plasma membrane, and then outside of that, we have a rather thin layer of peptidoglycan. And then outside of that, we have a second membrane. Now don't get the two membranes confused. The plasma membrane is in direct contact with the cytosol. It's in contact with the inside of the cell. The outer membrane contains, again, some special lipids and special proteins that may give these cells some special properties. And once again, we do have lipoproteins and other compounds that are going to hold this structure together. Gram staining is a classic lab technique. It's been done for over 130 years and it continues to be important. After you've stained your cells, you look at them under the microscope and if they stain pink, then we know we're dealing with a gram negative bacterium. So this is a bacterium that has a plasma membrane, a thin layer of peptidoglycan, and then a second membrane outside of that. Cells that stain dark blue or purple are gram positive cells. And those cells have a thick layer of peptidoglycan and only one bilipid layer. Here we're seeing those structures again. So in gram positive cells, we have that thick layer of peptidoglycan, the rods are representing the sugars, and then we have peptides that are holding them together, and we have proteins and lipids that are holding that to the plasma membrane. In gram negative cells, we have that thin layer of peptidoglycan sandwiched between two lipid bilayers. The space between the two lipid bilayers that contains that peptidoglycan is known as the periplasmic space, and it contains a matrix of proteins. It can be kind of gel-like. Within that periplasmic space, we may have some rather important enzymes that help to protect the cell, as we'll see. Briefly, we'll look at the technique of gram staining, but this is something we will come back to. What you do is you take some bacteria cells and you stick them to a slide. After that, you apply a dye known as crystal violet. This is a very dark purple dye that sticks to peptidoglycan. You wash off the excess and you add iodine. Iodine will bind to the peptidoglycan and bind to the crystal violet. It helps the crystal violet stick to the peptidoglycan. Now remember that gram-positive cells have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan, so they're going to absorb a lot of this crystal violet. But the gram-negative cells have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, and it's hidden away between two membranes. So not very much of that peptidoglycan is going to get stained, and because it's thin, it's not going to retain very much stain. The next thing you do is you very briefly rinse these cells in an alcohol wash. What that does is it strips away the majority of the crystal violet. However, in the gram positive cells, because there's just so much peptidoglycan, some of that crystal violet will remain stuck. Now remember, the crystal violet didn't really get to the peptidoglycan in the gram negative cells, and even if it did, there's so little peptidoglycan that not very much stuck. When you add that alcohol to your cells, if you're dealing with gram negative cells, they actually have the uh, membrane, the outer membrane, stripped away by the alcohol. 
So after this, your gram positive cells are going to appear um, purple or dark blue, and your gram negative cells will appear clear. The very last thing you do is you add a dye known as safranin, which gives you a pink color. It will stick to the gram negative cells so that we can see them, because otherwise we wouldn't see them at all. Some of it will stick to the gram positive cells as well, but the crystal violet overpowers that color and those cells will still appear purple. At this point, you might be thinking that gram positive cells are a bit tougher than gram negative cells. Gram positive cells have that really, really thick layer of peptidoglycan. But you'd be wrong, unfortunately. So gram negative cells actually are more resistant and adaptable to changes in their environment and also to toxins and things that we might throw at them. So the gram negative cells do have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan, but we can't understate the importance of that outer membrane. Remember that lipid membranes are selectively permeable. They have channels in them. They can control what gets in and what gets out of the cell. So with two membranes, the cell has more opportunity to regulate what gets in and what gets out. That outer membrane has channels that can control the movement of stuff. Anything that gets through that outer membrane also has to get across that periplasm or periplasmic space that contains a lot of enzymes that can break down toxins and antibiotics and so on. And then anything that gets across that has to get through the plasma membrane as well. So it can be rather difficult to get antimicrobials and antibiotics into a gram negative cell. Gram negative cells are more difficult to kill. Also note that gram negative cells have these special lipopolysaccharides in the outer membrane. And these are things that can be toxic. They can damage other cells, cells that a gram negative bacterium might attach to, for instance. And also when these cells die, they release all those potentially toxic compounds that are found within the outer membrane. And that can cause an immune response or a toxic response within the body. There are other forms of cell wall in the bacteria. One of the more important ones would be the acid fast cell walls of the mycobacteria. These bacteria have a plasma membrane, of course, and outside of that, they have some peptidoglycan. Outside of that, they don't have another membrane, but they have a layer of mycolic acid. Mycolic acid is hydrophobic, it's waxy, and if you were to stain these cells, let's say using crystal violet, the stain wouldn't stick. It doesn't stick to those hydrophobic, non-charged compounds. In order to identify this type of cell wall, you have to use a special technique known as acid fast staining, where you heat the cells and use solvents that drive dyes into the interior of the cell. And we'll attempt that in lab as well. And we'll also talk about this a lot more in future lectures. That layer of mycolic acid makes these bacteria kind of tough. It protects them against lots of different toxins and antibodies and your immune system. So one of the main players of this mycobacterium group is mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. It lives inside your lungs. Your white blood cells attempt to engulf the cells and destroy them, but they can't break them down. And in fact, the bacteria live and reproduce inside the white blood cells and eventually kill them. So that makes these difficult cells to deal with when they're growing inside your body. The mycolic acid is rather difficult to produce and it actually takes a long time for these cells to divide. So a typical bacterial cell, something like E. coli, can divide every 20 minutes, whereas these mycobacteria tend to divide every 25 hours or so. That means that if you get tuberculosis, the bacterium will divide and spread very slowly. It's a chronic 
disease that takes a long time to develop, but it's very, very good at resisting the defenses that are presented by your body. And here we can see the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. We're seeing it stained with acid fast staining that results in a purplish color. The cells in the background, the blue cells, would be cells that were coughed up from the lining of the lungs. So typically what you would do is you would have someone cough up material onto a slide, you would stain that and identify the presence of these bacterial cells. I mentioned earlier that bacteria have this weird little trick where they can transfer bits of information between them. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. Back in the 1950s, a researcher by the name of Joshua Lederberg did a rather interesting experiment. He had two strains of E. coli. So when we refer to something as a strain, we're talking about two populations of the same organism that differ in some way. So we had one lab strain of E. coli that was unable to synthesize a particular amino acid. He had another strain of E. coli that was also unable to synthesize one particular amino acid, but it was a different one. So just for the sake of simplicity, let's say that we have our one strain of E. coli here that can produce item B, whatever that is. It's something that's essential. It's an essential nutrient that bacteria would normally be able to make, but it can't make A, something that it should be able to make, but there's a mutation. It can't make that nutrient and it can't survive without it. Then we have another population of E. coli, another strain, that are the opposite. They can make this A, but they can't make the B nutrient, and of course they can't survive without that. Now if we were to explain the genetics of this, we would say that the first one is A negative, so the gene that's responsible for making the enzyme or whatever it is that's needed to make A is non-functional. Negative means non-functional, and the plus tells us that the genes that are needed to make that second nutrient are functional. Neither of these bacteria will grow on what's called minimal media. Minimal media is media that contains the bare essentials to keep a normal, healthy bacterium alive. So we have to supplement both of these strains. We have to give them the one thing that they're not capable of producing on their own if we want to keep these cultures going in the lab. But if we put them on, you know, just the bare minimum that most bacteria need, they won't survive. Now, what he noted is that if he took these two bacteria and he tried to grow them on minimal media, they won't grow. We discussed why, because the first one can't make A and the second one can't make B and they need that. And that's not in the media for them. But he found that if he took the two cultures and he mixed them together and then put them on a plate, he got growth. So how is that possible? Well, what he concluded, and it was later shown to be true, was that these two bacteria were swapping bits and pieces of DNA. This is a process known as transduction, where one cell picks up new information from its environment or from other cells. So what had happened was some of the cells that lacked the ability to make that A nutrient, whatever it was, they picked up the missing information, the missing genes that they needed to make the appropriate enzymes and so on from the other culture. And the reverse probably happened as well. But we ended up with some cells, not very many, so we've got billions of cells in, in these tubes, but we ended up with a few cells, maybe just a few hundred, that managed to get everything they needed. So obviously these bacteria were swapping bits of information. They were swapping bits of DNA, and that was a pretty exciting discovery. Letterberg went on to describe the process by which this occurs. So what we have happening is one cell producing a pilus, which is a structure that can transfer information to another cell. This structure is sometimes referred to as a sex pilus, as you can see here, but I would say that that's a misnomer. We don't really have sex occurring in this situation. Sex is where we have two individuals 
that come together to produce a brand new individual. So for instance, think of your parents having sex. I actually don't think about that, but your father and your mother each contributed a full set of information, a full genetic blueprint. Those blueprints came together in the zygote and produced you. And you, of course, are a brand new individual. Here, what's happening is information is being transferred from one organism to another. So think of this in human terms. If we could do this, what might we do? We might take our finger and poke the person next to us and transfer information to that person and change their eye color. I mean, that would be a pretty neat trick. So bacteria can transfer bits of information to other cells and change those cells, but they're not creating a new individual. So technically, this is not sex. So what happens is this pilus is projected out and it grabs onto another cell. And the first thing that happens is it pulls that cell closer. The actual transfer that's going to occur is known as conjugation, but that very first step is pulling the two cells towards each other. And as the two cells are drawn closer together, the plasma membranes are going to fuse and we're going to get this bridge or tunnel of cytoplasm that connects the two cells directly. Once this happens, the F plasmid in the donor cell is going to unravel. Remember, DNA consists of two strands. So one strand is going to be passed through that bridge over to the other cell. Once we have this single stranded plasmid in each cell, that can serve as a template to make a new strand of DNA. And we end up with double stranded plasmids again. Note that the donor cell is said to have a genotype of F positive. That means it has an F plasmid, whereas the recipient cell is F negative. It doesn't have an F plasmid, but at the end, both of these cells have an F plasmid. And now that recipient cell can make a pillus and share information with another cell. So this can spread rather quickly. Incidentally, I'll just point out that bacterial cells are haploid. They only have one set of information, and that's something that uh, we may come back to. Remember I mentioned that gram-negative cells are tougher to kill? Well, that's actually only partly true. When we're talking about vegetative cells, these are cells that are actively undergoing binary fission and they're doing their everyday, day-to-day -day thing. That's true. If we have a gram-negative cell that's placed in rather harsh conditions, what it will do is it will put up a fight. It has that outer membrane. It will do all that it can to destroy any toxins that are present, etc. Now, gram-positive cells have a different strategy. If gram-positive cells become stressed by a harsh environment, let's say we try to kill them with a bit of toxin or antibiotic or something like that, if they have enough time to respond, what they will do is they will form an endospore and wait it out they will form this very, very tough, dormant, resistant spore that can survive very, very harsh conditions. And then when conditions get better, that endospore will germinate and give rise to a new active vegetative cell. Typically, only gram-positives make these endospores, but there are some exceptions to the rule. There are a few gram-negatives that can make spores, but that's rather rare. Anthrax is a gram-positive bacterium that can make these very, very resistant endospores. A lot of people don't realize this, but back in 2001, when we had the 9-11 attacks in New York, there were also a number of tainted letters that were sent to politicians. These letters contained anthrax spores. And in fact, several people were killed by these anthrax spores. You can see in the photograph on the right, we have Bacillus anthracis. This is what causes anthrax. And the arrows are picking out these very, very resistant endospores. Let's take a look at how endospores form 
in gram-positive bacteria. So we'll start with this cell here. Now, if this cell is happy, if there's plenty of water and plenty of food and the pH is right and so on, this cell will undergo vegetative growth. It'll divide by binary fission as quickly as it can and make lots and lots of little cells. But if conditions get harsh, let's say the water starts to dry out, the pH changes, maybe it's slowly being poisoned by some sort of toxin, then it will enter into this pathway. It will enter into a process known as sporulation. The cell is going to divide, but notice that the division is asymmetric. Instead of getting two cells that are the same size, we get one small cell and one larger cell. The smaller cell is known as the forespore, and the larger cell is known as the mother cell. Now something quite fascinating happens. The mother cell is going to engulf, it's going to eat the forespore. It's not gonna break it down, but it's going to surround it. So you can see down here, we have one cell now, the forespore, that's entirely surrounded by the mother cell. And because of that, we have two membranes around that forespore, one that came from that smaller cell and one that came from the mother cell. Next, what's gonna happen, that mother cell will continue to protect that cell. It's basically given it a big hug and surrounded it because things are getting bad out there. But the mother cell and also the spore are going to start dumping protein into that space between the two membranes. And we're gonna build up this really tough cortex. The mother cell will keep producing more and more material as long as it can until it's killed by whatever the harsh conditions are. But by the time that mother cell is killed, we have this really, really tough, thick wall around that spore cell. The DNA breaks down within the mother cell, but the DNA is preserved within the spore. And that cell becomes dormant and it can stay dormant for a very, very long time. But if conditions improve, then that spore will germinate and will go back to our starting cell. So this is a really fascinating way to survive harsh conditions. Instead of trying to deal with them, you just develop this really, really resistant spore. Endospores are remarkably resistant. In fact, endospores have been revived from vials that Louis Pasteur used about 160 years ago. So remember he did those experiments disproving spontaneous generation. Well, a museum in France found some of his vials. They revived the endospores that were dried up on the inside of those vials, and they've been growing cultures of the same bacteria that Louis Pasteur used so many years ago. Endospores have been revived from Egyptian mummies. Endospores that have been sitting in these dry conditions, completely dormant, for over 3,000 years. And this actually presents an interesting question. People that are working on these mummies are interested in how they died and also what sort of diseases and what kind of strains were going around at the time. And we've revived some strains that have been dead for a very long time. It's interesting because we can uncover perhaps plagues and outbreaks that killed people in the past and we can study those organisms so that we can prevent it from happening again. But at the same time, there's the ethical consideration of should we be reviving these ancient strains? People have reliably uh, germinated spores from Antarctic ice cores that are 8 million years old. So these are thick, thick ice layers that have built up from years and years and centuries and millennia of falling snow. That snow, that precipitation contains some spores and they were buried in these very, very deep ice layers. Now there are also some claims that endospores have been revived from the gut contents of a bee that was preserved in amber 25 million years ago. Amber is fossilized tree sap. 
So the idea is that this bee got stuck in some tree sap and became fossilized. Now this one I'm a bit critical of. Uh, there's some doubt around this one. And the reason for that is when you're trying to extract material from something this old, there's very little of the material. And if you're taking that material and you're trying to grow up endospores on a plate, it's actually more likely that there were endospores floating around in the lab that gave rise to these cultures. So it's a little uncertain. The other three though, definitely they're well supported. So pili can be used to attach two cells to each other. And usually we're talking about one bacteria cell connecting to another for the purpose of transferring information, transferring DNA. We have these other appendages known as fimbriae, which are typically used by a bacterium to attach to a different cell type. So for instance, a bacterium might use fimbriae to stick itself to epithelial cells. Interestingly, quite often the genes that are needed to make fimbriae are also found on a plasmid and they can be passed through a conjugation pillus. So in some cases, one cell that's all spiky, like the one in the uh, lower left here, can pass that characteristic onto a cell that is naked, like the one at the top, and then that donor develops the ability to stick to epithelial cells and other cells. Here we're seeing fimbriae again, but we're also seeing flagella. Those are the longer appendages. Flagella are quite different in that they're not rigid structures that are used to attach to other things. Instead, they spin and they're used to move the bacterium. If an organism is capable of movement, we say that it's motile. Not all bacteria are motile. Some of them lack flagella. So for instance, almost all cocci bacteria lack flagella and are non-motile. In this diagram here, you're seeing a motile bacillus. So this is a rod-shaped bacteria that has lots of flagella. The flagella are going to spin, and you can see as they spin, they kind of get all tangled up and they spin together, and that causes the bacterium to move. Bacteria don't have a brain or anything resembling a nervous system, of course, because they are just a single, simple cell, but they can respond to gradients within their environment. So they can move towards something that they want to consume and they can move away from threats. Uh, they can move away from toxins and so on. So they will move and then they will throw out their flagella and that stops them. It stops them in their tracks and then they can change, change position and start spinning those flagella again. So they have this run and tumble kind of movement. In terms of both structure and function, the flagella of bacterial cells are very different from what we see in eukarya. So the flagella of eukaryotic cells wave back and forth, kind of like a fish's tail. Think of a sperm cell. We have a tail that goes back and forth. In bacteria, the flagella spins like a propeller. So we have this complex structure that is attached to essentially an electric motor. We have a structure that's anchored within the plasma membrane and also within the cell wall. In the diagram here, you're seeing a gram-positive cell. We have a thick layer of peptidoglycan that anchors the shaft of the base of this flagellum. Above that, we have a hook which acts like a swivel. Here, you're seeing the same thing, but in a gram-negative cell. Notice that we have an outer membrane and we have a plasma membrane. And then in the space between the two, we have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. Embedded within that, we have our little electric motor. And once again, we have that hook structure that's going to act as a swivel. The photograph, or more properly, the transmission electron micrograph that you see in the bottom right, shows what this looks like under the electron microscope. Flagella allow bacteria to move around. And that's what you're seeing here with these E. coli swimming on a microscope slide. But how do we know that those flagella spin instead of waving back and forth? 
imagine we have a bacterium and let's say it's a rod shaped bacterium so it's a bacillus and let's also say that it's a happy active little bacterium this bacterium is probably going to have at least one flagellum depending on the species of course but let's say we've got a few flagella here now what if we could attach one of those flagella to a slide there is a way we can do that so we've got our glass slide here we can use antibodies there are antibodies that will stick to the proteins that make up the bacterium we can also make antibodies that will stick to proteins that we coat on the glass these antibodies are going to act almost like a glue so we can tether our bacterium to the slide now if we're lucky and we get a few bacteria where we only tether one of the flagella then when the flagella tries to move of course the cell is going to move instead because the bacterium can't go anywhere imagine that we had a situation where the flagella moved side to side like the tail of a fish that's something we would see in eukaryotic cells sperm cells for instance if that were the case in bacteria then when this little guy tries to swim if we look at this under the microscope from above what we're going to see is we're going to see the cell wave from side to side but what if that flagellum spins if that's the case the entire cell is going to spin here we've got a bunch of bacteria some of which we've managed to glue to the slide we've tethered them to the slide by the end of the flagellum now let's see what happens if we let them try to escape notice that they're spinning around in circles they're spinning around in circles because that flagellum is causing the entire cell to rotate because the cell can't go anywhere flagella in eukaryotes sperm cells for instance have one flagellum are quite large they're quite thick they contain cytoplasm and they contain some structural supports and they're surrounded by the cell membrane but in prokaryotes the flagellum is solid it's made of a bunch of proteins stacked together and it's very very narrow so narrow that if you're looking at a bacterial cell underneath a light microscope you wouldn't be able to see the flagellum without some help in photograph B here you're seeing a bacterium as viewed under the scanning electron microscope and if you look carefully you can see two thin white lines one coming off from the right of the cell up towards the top and the other one coming off the left incidentally this cell has been caught within a very fine metal filter that's what those little pinpricks are that's to let fluid through now if we were to look at this with a light microscope like I said first of all it'd be very difficult to see the cell unless you stain it but it would be impossible to see the flagella even if you just stained them with something like crystal violet what you can use is something called a mordant a mordant is something that's used to help a stain stick or in some cases that mordant will simply just stick to the cell it'll build up in several layers and it can make very thin structures thicker and more readily visible and that's what's been done in these other photographs so we've used this chemical compound that will build up in layers kind of like layers of paint on the flagella so that we can actually see the flagella under the light microscope bacterial cells can have no flagella one flagella multiple flagella coming out of one end flagella coming out of both ends and flagella coming out all over the place now I don't expect you to remember the terms for these different arrangements but just realize that there is a lot of variety here and this is something we can use to identify different types of bacteria the bacterial flagellum is a remarkable machine 
What you're seeing here is a polytrichus bacterium, meaning it's got several flagella. We're looking at one and we can see how it's embedded within the cell wall. And this is the electric motor. There's channels there that hydrogen protons flow down and cause that motor to spin, which then causes the flagellum to spin. Spirochete bacteria are rather special. They have a corkscrew or twisted shape to them, and of course that would make them spirilli. They do have flagella, but they're not on the outside of the cell wall. These are gram-negative bacteria. They have a plasma membrane, and then they have an outer membrane. And the flagella are in between those two membranes. So for that reason, we call them endoflagella. Endo meaning inside. The flagella are attached to an electric motor at one end of the cell, and when this electric motor turns, it causes the entire cell to turn. So the cell will corkscrew through the water. When you're this small, water is rather viscous. It becomes almost like a gel at this scale. So this is a really interesting way of getting around. Rather than having free flagella that spin like propellers, the entire cell is going to corkscrew through the water. Here's a nice little animation that shows how this works. So again, we have these flagella shown in yellow here, and they're all bundled together. They're also called axial filaments. They have a motor at one end that's going to cause these long filaments, these long flagella, to spin. But because they're strapped to the side of the cell, because they're contained within those two membranes, they're going to cause the entire cell to rotate. As the cell rotates, because it has a corkscrew shape, it's going to push against the media. It's going to push against the water that surrounds it, and that will move it forward. What you're seeing here is one of these cells coming towards you. On the exterior of some bacterial cells, we have a glycocalyx. This is made out of polysaccharide. It can take one of two forms. We can have a capsule, which is neatly organized, so it's fairly dense and well-structured, or we could have a slime layer where we have a very loose, unorganized, and typically quite thick layer of polysaccharide. Slime layers and capsules can be rather sticky. They can help bacterial cells stick to epithelial cells, for instance. They also offer protection against your immune system. If you look at photograph B, we've got cells that are surrounded by a large capsule. That's that large, clear area. And that protects these cells. In fact, with this particular bacterium, if the capsule is present, they're rather dangerous. They can cause serious infections. If we look at a strain that doesn't have that capsule, the immune system has no trouble dealing with these cells and they're not a problem. We'll do some capsule staining within the lab because this is an important characteristic that you want to be able to determine. If a bacterium has a capsule, it's more likely to be virulent. It's more likely to cause infection. Bacteria don't typically exist as a monoculture. We don't typically just have one species living on a surface. We have lots of species that are competing with each other. These bacteria are also laying down sticky proteins that they use to attach themselves to the surface. In many cases, we've got this little ecosystem going on and we've got all this slime that helps them all stick together. And that slime and all the included bacteria forms something called a biofilm. A biofilm is quite literally a layer of living goo. So we have a mixture of cells and proteins and the secretions and excretions of these different cells. Here you're seeing a biofilm on the tooth and the biofilm can extend down below the gum line. 
Biofilms are more difficult to deal with. If we want to try to kill the bacteria that make up the biofilm, using antibiotics and uh, antimicrobials may not be effective because those chemicals can't penetrate this layer of material. Here we have an ulcer, an open sore on the foot of a diabetic patient. We have several different species of bacteria living in this sore. They're secreting proteins that help them stick together and stick to the foot. But at the same time, those proteins and this kind of dense collection of material inhibits the penetration of anything that we might try to treat the surface with. In cystic fibrosis, we have a genetic condition where chloride ions are not pumping as they should. They should be pumping chloride ions out into the respiratory tract and into the throat, and then water would also be drawn out of the cells, which would result in a fairly thin mucus. But in these individuals, the mucus is very, very thick. We have bacteria that are embedded within that mucus, and because the mucus is so viscous, antibiotics and white blood cells can't get to those bacteria. And this, as you might imagine, is a big problem. So not only are these individuals essentially drowning in their own mucus, they also can't fight the bacteria that are living within that mucus. A biofilm begins when bacteria colonize a new surface. Now, any living surface, for instance, the surface of the epithelial cells in your body is not gonna be clean. There's gonna be proteins and other molecules stuck to it. Proteins that have been manufactured by the underlying cells, proteins that are contained within the mucus, within the lumen of the cavity that's lined by the epithelium as well. Bacteria come in and they create their own proteins that help them stick or adsorb with a D to those proteins. More and more bacteria will come in of different species. Of course, the bacteria that are there will divide. And as they do that, they produce more what are called exopolymers. So these are large molecules that are secreted to help them stay in place. As we develop a thicker and thicker layer of bacteria, they start to produce polysaccharides. So they'll produce a glycocalyx, one glycocalyx from one cell, might be stuck to the glycocalyx of the next cell. And now we have this rather thick, viscous goo that helps protect the bacterial cells that are embedded within it. Bits of this can break off and the bits will include some of that goo and different species of bacteria that are contained within it. And then that bit can go off and start a new biofilm somewhere else. Biofilms are more likely to become established and cause problems on dead and damaged tissue. And once they're established, they are rather difficult for your body to deal with. And they can be difficult to deal with using medications as well. So antibodies and other antimicrobial compounds can't get to the bacteria. The family tree or phylogenetic tree of bacteria is rather complex. Although many bacteria look identical under the microscope, they can vary fundamentally in their metabolic pathways and their biochemistry. We're gonna focus on just a few groups. Now, because our focus in this course is on pathogens, we'll just talk about the groups that contain members that can be harmful to us. First of all, we have the proteobacteria. This is a big group. This includes E. coli and many other bacteria that we'll look at in the lab, and it also includes the ancestor of the mitochondria. We've got gram-positive bacteria, and they can be divided into two subgroups. We have low G and C and high G and C. This refers to the quantity of those nucleotides, G and C, within the chromosome. Then we have chlamydia, which is a fascinating little microbe. It's a very, very small cell. In fact, it's among the smallest known cells. And it is an obligate parasite. By obligate, I mean it's 
obligated to be a parasite. It can't do anything else. It's an endoparasite. It lives inside other cells. It can't last very long outside of a host cell and it can't reproduce outside of a host cell. It shares some similarities with viruses. Then we have the spirochetes. These are corkscrew shaped bacteria as we've discussed that corkscrew through the water. Here we're seeing a breakdown of those groups. So again, proteobacteria, this is a huge group with lots of important members, the vast majority not harmful, but there are some, of course, that cause us problems. We have the alpha subgroup, the gamma, the delta, the epsilon. Um, I'm not going to have you worry about all of these subgroups that are named after Greek letters. We also have chlamydia, as I mentioned, we have the spirochetes, and then we have the gram-positive bacteria. Now, cyanobacteria are incredibly important. As we've talked about, they've produced all of the oxygen, pretty much, that we find in our atmosphere. So they've produced that directly, and then also they gave rise to chloroplasts that also produce oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis. Now, I've crossed them out because they're not pathogenic. So please appreciate the importance of cyanobacteria, but thankfully they're not something that infects us. Most gram-positive bacteria can be identified quite simply using gram staining. Remember that they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan and that will retain a lot of crystal violet and they will appear dark blue or purple. However, things are not always as simple as we'd like them to be. There are some gram-positive bacteria that have lost their cell wall, and there are others that have modified cell walls that won't retain gram-positive stain. So first of all, we have mycoplasmas. Mycoplasmas have completely lost their cell wall. We assume that they're related to gram-positive because of their chemistry and because of their DNA sequences. However, if we were to gram stain them, because there is no peptidoglycan whatsoever, the crystal violet won't stick. And then we're left with our secondary stain, the safranin, which will stain them pink, and we might incorrectly identify them as gram negative. Then we have the mycobacteria. They have a wall that's similar to what we see in other gram positive cells, in that they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan, and they don't have an outer membrane. However, outside of the peptidoglycan, they have a layer of mycolic acid. Mycolic acid is hydrophobic, and things don't penetrate this layer very well. If we want to stain these cells, we have to use heat, and we have to use some rather nasty solvents to get the stain into the cell. So if we try to gram stain these cells, they won't take up any dye. The dye can't get to the peptidoglycan, so they don't take up any of that crystal violet, and they won't appear blue as we would expect for a gram-positive cell. The best example of this is Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is one we'll come back to. As mentioned before, this is what causes tuberculosis. Next, we have the proteobacteria. These are all gram-negative. They have an outer membrane, and they have a thin layer of peptidoglycan between that outer membrane and the plasma membrane. This group is divided into five classes or subgroups that are named after the first five letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. A lot of these bacteria are bacteria that you will be familiar with. Things like Escherichiae, uh, Pseudomonas. These are bacteria that we work with in the lab. There are quite a few members that do cause diseases and we will talk about those later. Escherichiae coli, E. coli, is a bacterium we'll spend a lot of time talking about and also working with in the lab. It's a nice example of a typical proteobacterium. It is typically helpful to us. It lives in the gut and it releases vitamins for us and it helps us break down our food a little bit more, but there can be strains that cause us problems. Escherichiae coli is sometimes referred to as the bacterial lab rat. And what I mean by that is a lot of what we know about bacteria has come from the study of E. coli. We have sequenced the entire genome, and that's what you're seeing on the left there. 
And we use this bacteria to help us in other endeavors. We use it to amplify or make copies of bits of DNA from all sorts of things. We use it to manufacture pharmaceuticals as well. So we can take the gene for human insulin, take it out of a human, put it into a plasmid, put that into E. coli, and we can trick E. coli into producing human insulin, something, of course, it wouldn't otherwise do. Spirochetes, as we talked about, have an unusual way of getting around. They have these axial filaments or endoflagella that are strapped to the side of the cell and they spin the entire cell. An important member of this group is Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease. The Borrelia bacterium is transferred from one host to another by the tick. If you're bitten by an infected tick, the first symptom that you're likely to encounter is kind of a bullseye like rash around the site of the bite. And it's important to get this treated quickly because the bacterium will spread into the bloodstream. It can become a systemic body-wide infection and cause neurological damage. And the last bacterium we'll talk about today is chlamydiae, which causes chlamydia. These are tiny, tiny bacterial cells that live inside other cells and parasitize them. If you have chlamydia, then you will have these cells living within the cells that line the interior of your urogenital tract. As is the case with most parasites, they've evolved to become much simpler. So they evolve from more complex bacterial cells, but of course, if you're a parasite, a lot of the hard stuff, a lot of the work is being done for you by your host. So it makes sense to simplify. They've lost the ability to make ATP, which is really quite extraordinary. I can't think of any other cells that have lost that fundamental aspect of their metabolism. So they have to steal ATP from the cell that they're living in. They appear to be related to spirochetes, but because there's so little of them left, that's kind of open for debate. But they will enter into a cell and they will replicate within a vacuole inside the cell. And then that vacuole will ultimately rupture and release the cells into the interstitial space where they can go on and infect other cells. Again, there's lots of similarities with viruses here. That process of releasing the chlamydia causes damage to the cell. And also, while well, you've got chlamydia inside the cell, the chlamydia is putting a huge strain on the resources of the cell. So that was our brief introduction to the bacteria, and we'll come back to many of the pathogenic forms again. Realize that bacteria are prokaryotic cells. They have fundamental structural differences from eukaryotes. They don't have a nucleus, they don't have organelles, etc. Prokaryotes are the simplest living things, although recognize that even a bacterial cell is still pretty darn complex. Bacteria are classified mainly based on their shape and structure and biochemistry and metabolism. That's kind of the classic way of doing things. But also nowadays, we very frequently use the genes that code for ribosomal RNA. So we sequence those genes and compare the sequences. Bacteria are often named based on their shape and their cell arrangement, and sometimes the color that they present on a plate, etc. So pay attention to the names. They will tell you something about the bacteria. Sometimes the name will also tell you what disease might be caused by the bacterium. As always, our focus in this course is to learn what makes these different organisms unique and then figure out how we can use those characteristics to limit their growth or kill them. So you should be aware of the special adaptations and structures that we have in bacteria. So for instance, bacteria have a cell wall made out of peptidoglycan. We don't have that. So that's a potential target for drugs and antimicrobials. If we can come up with something, and we have come up with many things, that attack the cell wall or make it difficult for the bacterial cell to make a cell wall, then that will harm the bacteria without harming our cells. You're responsible for knowing all the groups that I've outlined, and I would like you to know at least one example from each of these groups. That's the sort of question you might be asked on a test. I've put a link here that will take you to a web page that will help you pronounce some of these names. Some of them are a bit tricky. <laughs>
Finally, here's our terminology. And a few questions to share with family and friends.